Before we begin, we'd like to give special thanks to all of our sponsors for helping make this event possible each year. Specifically, thank you to CRL FormFox for being our title sponsor for five consecutive years. And thank you to our platinum sponsors, Orisure Technologies, Psychmedics, Samba Safety, UKG, and Quest Diagnostics. Thank you so much for joining us for this drug testing industry update session focused on industry challenges, threats, and tools to overcome those threats and challenges. Today, we're joined by Brady Quarles, DISA's AVP of Industrial Sales. Brady, how are you today? I'm doing great, Thomas. Well, before we jump into the presentation, I just want to remind everyone that if they have any questions, use the Q&A button at the bottom right of the player. Any questions we're unable to answer today, we'll reach back out to you after day with DISA. Additionally, we'll make a copy of the presentation available for download on the materials tab at the end of the session. With that being said, Brady, the floor is yours. Well, thank you everyone for having me today. Once again, my name is Brady Quarles. Uh, why are we here today? We're gonna to be talking about building a culture of safety with an effective drug program. Um, I, I've done this before, but obviously we, we always try to make this uh, conversation a little bit better by providing new information to share with the group. Um, so moving on uh, to slide two, you know, why are we here? We're here to raise awareness about illicit drug use and the challenges organizations will have in today's environment that includes COVID-19, you know, inflation, recession, and elevated drug use within, you know, our country. Um, going over to the next slide, we, we can talk about stats that stand out. You know, during the presentation, you know, we're definitely going to spend time looking at graphs and statistical data, you know, but I wanted to make sure that we highlight this information up front because in my mind, this is you know, why we're here. Illicit drug use uh, is increasing and it's becoming more dangerous. In 2021, the U.S. recorded the most overdose deaths in the history of the country. We had over 107,000 people die of overdoses. You know, the previous record before that was actually in 2020. And so what we're seeing there in 2020, we we're probably around 92,000 or so. Uh, so this number is continuing to climb. Uh, so what are we looking at on this graph? You know, unfortunately, we're looking at the ca catastrophic rise in overdose deaths within the last 20 years. Starting in 2000, you know, our nation lost about 20,000 people to overdose deaths. I think that we can all agree that that number is probably too high, but it's obviously it's going to get worse and it has. Um, what has happened over time, according to the statistical data provided, is that we, you know, we've seen a gradual but very significant increase in deaths you know, heading into 2015. Within the initial 15 year time period, overdose deaths per year increased by about 150%. That's alarming to say the least. You know, how about, two, how about 2015 through 2021? Uh, when we look at overdose deaths from 2015 to 2021, the overdose rates, you know, they, they increased sharply in a smaller amount of time. So from 2015 to 2021, uh, you see 107% increase. Uh, that's actually highlighted by a 65% uh, increase in overdose deaths from 2019 to 2021. Uh, overdose deaths you know, are trending in the wrong direction and it's going to get worse. Why is it happening? You know, first of all, you know, I'd say that everyone has their opinions on the subject, but I believe that the answer uh, to this question revolves around a number of factors that we will discuss throughout this presentation. You know, we have drug use becoming more socially acceptable in our culture. Unfortunately, the more, you know, the more people you have using drugs, the more that increases over, you know, overdose uh, potential. How about environmental factors pertaining to times of crisis? You know, during a global or national crisis, substance abuse historically always increases. Uh, to give you a couple of examples, you know, this is after both probably Hurricane Katrina as well as the terrorist attacks of 9-11, we saw substance abuse increase uh, in the impacted uh, geographic regions around the New York and Louisiana area. You know, speaking of catastrophes, 
you know, why didn't we see the spike in the last few years? You know, unfortunately, you know, we had to deal with something different than 2020. COVID-19 was a worldwide pandemic that caused the same stress, anxiety, and fear that 9-11 and Katrina did. So please, you know, so people, you know, think about this. So people across the nation and even around the globe self-medicated to deal with these, the symptoms of depression and even uh, potentially post-traumatic stress. You know, let that sink in a little bit. In the last few years, uh, we've seen a bump that started with COVID and it's continually, it's continuing thanks to the potential, you know, of an economic crisis. More hardship and despair in an environment will always lead to a percentage of our society probably turn into drugs and alcohol to help them cope with the stresses you know, of their surroundings. Unfortunately, you know, this type of activity also equals more overdoses, especially when certain drugs like fentanyl you know, are making recreational drug use more lethal. Like anything, you know, drugs have evolved throughout the years in an effort to make drugs uh, that are cheaper. You know, the cartels are using dangerous substances to create an end product on the cheap. You know, when you cut corners in quality control with substances like fentanyl, people die. And you know, we're seeing that played out on the, you know, the national news every day. Lastly, you know, in an effort to wrap up this slide, you know, we've talked about several factors uh, that are contributing to the historic death rates uh, for overdoses. Public opinion will continue to ease, drugs will continue to be dangerous, and catastrophic events will continue to shape the world that we live in. You know, make sure that you're, you're, you're properly drug testing your employees during all times, especially in times of hardship. You know, drug abuse isn't going away. So let's, you know, let's make sure that uh, your organizations are prepared on how to identify these illicit drug users. So moving on to the next slide, let's talk about historic positivity rates by test type. <clears throat> Once again, you know, I, I'm throwing a lot of stats at you, but, you know, I feel like the information is important. You know, what you're looking at here is non-DOT positivity rates broken down by three different reasons to test. You know, the graph compares positivity rates from a five-year period. You're looking at 2018 ending in 2022. Um, with this slide, you know, we wanted to point out a, a few details to take note, uh, you know, to, to take note of what we're seeing here. On the far left, you know, we're comparing positivity rates for random testing uh, for, the for a five-year period. In my opinion, you know, random testing is one of the most important types of tests when it comes to identifying and preventing illicit drug use within an organization. You know, when an employee knows uh, that they could be pulled for a random at any time, they're more than likely to abstain. Uh, that is why, you know, you see a low positivity rate, you know, for the random testing, you know, on this slide. One other note, it isn't a coincidence uh, that the highest positivity rates for random testing happened in 2020. What happened in 2020? We've already kind of talked about it, uh, COVID-19. So, you know, how about pre-employment testing? By far, pre-employment testing is uh, the most prevalent type of testing out there. Most companies are always testing applicants before they're added into the workforce. You know, what do the trends look like for pre-employment testing? For the most part, you know, we see these positivity rates, you know, they were pretty static leading into like 2020. Um, after 2020, you know, we are, we see a sharp rise uh, due to the pandemic, more than likely. Um, the continued escalation of these numbers, on, you know, aren't helped by additional adversity. We've already kind of talked about inflation and the fear of looming recession, you know, around the corner potentially. Overall, you know, I would say positivity rates are, you know, are trending up. You know, we've seen, you know, a 11% increase in positivity rates within the last few years. These trends will more than likely only continue to go up as well. So moving on to the next slide, corporate employees more likely to abuse, you know, how about, you know, we take a look at non-DOT positivity rates for a few different types of drugs in the same time period once again. Uh, the focus here, you know, will be corporate employees. Uh, these aren't employees working out in the refineries or working on the pipelines. These are people working in sales, IT, finance, you know, working within the organizations, working behind a desk potentially. So, you know, starting with marijuana, you know, what are we looking at? You know, uh, starting with marijuana, you know, and this is no surprise, but, you know, minus a small dip in positives in 2021, positivity rates continue to rise. Environmental challenges affect this, but public opinion on marijuana is, is changing as well. 
Uh, marijuana is now more socially acceptable. And states across the country are now allowing medicinal and recreational use. So those are things that you know, we're going to have to look at. You know, how about pharmaceuticals? Uh, let's take a look at the opioids and amphetamines on the chart. Although positivity rates for amphetamines are historically higher you know, year over year versus opioids, the trending is almost identical for both types of drugs. Trends show that positives were static in 2018 and 2019 for both drugs. You know, once we get into the post-COVID years, you know, the rates increase, you know, they increase dramatically. You know, maybe pharmaceuticals positivity rates are lower than marijuana year over year, uh, but the rates have increased for these drugs over like four, 400% in the last five years. Trends for these types of drugs uh, present a challenge in the employee screening world. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, more as well. Moving on to the next slide, consequences of drug use in the workplace. So how does drug use affect your organization? <clears throat> As most people know, you know, actions always have consequences. Uh, when it comes to drug and alcohol use on the, on the job, the consequences can uh, be costly uh, to a company, that's for sure. Uh, in addition to monetary losses, people can get hurt or even lose their lives. If organizations aren't mitigating risks and working to keep illicit drug and alcohol users out of the workforce, you know, as an organization, you're going to want to know, you know, the consequences of drug use in the workplace, uh, you know, what that is and what it looks like. So what are some of the, the consequences? You know, first of, all, first of all, you know, poor work performance is a big one. Um, what does poor work performance look like? You know, that's inconsistent, inconsistent quality of work. Uh, employees with lack of focus, poor decision making. How about uh, increased absenteeism? Individuals that abuse substances are more inclined to call in sick from hangovers or other ailments specific to substance abuse. So it's something that uh, you have to live with. Increased turnover, you know, substance abusers will have performance challenges and companies will need to move on from these individuals in most cases. Uh, so that, that's, that's going to provide you with some challenges as well. Well, so, you know, how about consequences? You know, there's also monetary consequences as well. Uh, we talked about increased turnover, you know, with, with increased turnover, you also have to talk about increased time and money it will take to train and onboard these individuals, these, these replacements. Um, how about theft? Illicit drug users will often resort to stealing in order to support a habit. Substance abuse can make decent people make poor decisions. So always be mindful of the, the fact and continue to drug test people even after they're hired. Lastly, accidents. You know, accidents can lead to loss of life and or equipment. Any actions that impact a person's judgment, uh, it could be their alertness, their perception, their motor, motor coordination. Uh, it's something that you, we should definitely be looking at. So moving on, uh, we've got cost to employees. Uh, with this slide, you know, we, we wanted to show the group uh, what illicit drug and alcohol uh, use costs companies on a national level. Additionally, you know, we'll answer the question about, you know, if drug and alcohol abuse is a factor uh, in work-related fatalities. I'll give you a little hint. Yes, it is. <laughs> but uh, let's start with costs. Uh, U.S. companies lose over $100 billion annually on drug and alcohol related abuse. If 17% of the workforce is considered substance abusers, each abuser probably costs, uh, you know, company probably about $7,000 a year a piece. You know, we talked about absenteeism, you know, substance abusers are five times more likely to be absent. Uh, abusers also account for 35% of all of the absenteeism within the United States. Those are huge numbers. Um, we also mentioned uh, performance issues with substance abusers. Substance abusers are generally one third less productive uh, than what they would be normally if they weren't under the influence. Very concerning. Um, also, theft. Theft in the workplace can harm companies' bottom line. Substance abusers typically account for about 40% of all thefts reported to, uh, by organizations. Um, that can add up very quickly. You know, companies are obviously affected by illicit drug use. As a number of people know, attending this webinar, uh, the company I work for, DISA, you know, we cater to safety sensitive organizations. You know, DISA believes that illicit drug users in a safety sensitive setting will cost their companies even more. 
So in, in, in my mind, a lot more. Um, we believe that annual cost per year is probably more like 35,000 annually for safety sensitive abusers. Uh, that's, man, that's huge. Uh, that's about a 400% increase from the normal non-safety non sensitive uh, workplace estimation there. So um, lastly, just a couple more things, you know, workers comp also contributes to employer costs, 40 to 50% of all workers uh, worker cop claims are caused by drug abusers and also you know how about fatalities 10 to 20 percent of all fatalities in the workplace result in positive drug and alcohol tests one fatality or, or too many so let's do what we can to uh, mitigate risks here okay moving on um, we're going to a, our second section now that's drug testing challenges uh, the first slide that we'll talk about is marijuana marijuana public opinion in this section, you know, I want to make a point <clears throat> to you that individuals' uh, thoughts and beliefs about specific drugs are evolving. The evolution, the evolution of these thoughts and beliefs can make your job of managing your drug and alcohol program very challenging. So let's take a look at what we're looking at here. So in 1969, only 12% of adults supported the legalization of marijuana. Since then, a lot has changed. You know, support for you know, legalization has increased. And in 2021, most Americans, basically 68% of all Americans supported legalization. You know, let's take a look at the graph a little bit more and you know, take a look at it. And first and foremost, you've got uh, you know, the horizontal access. Okay, this is just basically the age groups. Uh, you also have the vertical access. You know, we have the percentage of people that support the legalization of marijuana. You know, just a few takeaways here, you know, and some of this information is probably not surprising, but uh, the younger you are, uh, the more likely that you'll support legalization. Surprise, surprise. You know, in addition, you know, just looking at the steady climb from 1969 to 2021, the percentage of Americans that support legalization have increased by about 56 percent in the last 50 years. Who knows what these numbers will look like in the future? You know, let's just make sure uh, that your organization, your company is prepared for the, ch you know, the changes uh, that are coming. Uh, what do some of these changes uh, potentially look like? Uh, we'll go to the next slide and we'll start talking about that. <clears throat> for the next slide, uh, we're sitting here, we're gonna go ahead and talk about the state of marijuana legalization. You know, looking at the map, you know, a state that uh, deems marijuana fully legal is represented by the color white. Um, so it's the lighter states. Uh, the darker colored states represent states with some form of marijuana legalization, uh, and some obviously are full. Um, going back, you know, probably five or six years ago, most of this map would probably would have been, you know, lighter or, you know, light green to say the least. Uh, now, where are we? You know, now the entire West Coast is legalized and the East Coast isn't far behind. In addition, almost all states minus a few have, you know, have some form of marijuana acceptance. You know, with that being said, you know, what will the United States look like in the future? You know, more and more states, you know, are moving to legalize marijuana in some forms. And I think there's around 19 current sites right now that have fully legalized marijuana. I mean, that's fully. Um, more concerning, you know, some states are now removing employer protections uh, for organizations that are testing for marijuana and non-federally regulated job positions. A couple of these states uh, are New York and New Jersey. We might talk a little bit more about that in the future. But, you know, what does the removal of employer protections mean to you? You know, essentially it means that you don't have the ability to penalize an employee if they test positive for marijuana. You know, talk about a strange new world that we're living in, you know, identifying individuals that are under the influence of marijuana, you know, will, you know, will be needed for the future. That's a, that's a fact. You know, in the drug testing world, technology, you know, has to evolve with the times. Uh, and we'll speak about some of that future, you know, some of that future technology um, that might be coming up uh, here shortly. With that, we'll go ahead and move forward and, uh, and into uh, marijuana facts and figures. So from 2017 to 2021, you know, we're seeing a steady rise in marijuana use. Positive marijuana drug tests are up 50%. You know, looking at you know, the most up-to-date information between 2021 and 2022, positivity rates are up 9%, so we're still seeing those positive trends. 
One other note, in states that have legalized marijuana fully, you know, the rates are even higher. So states like Colorado, Washington, New York, and New Jersey, they, they all come to mind, but positivity rates for these, uh, you know, these locations are far outpacing other states uh, that aren't fully legalized. In order to continue you know, our discussion on marijuana, I wanna reiterate uh, that the challenge of managing a drug-free workplace will become more difficult with the further, further legalization of marijuana. Alcohol is legal, but the substance still has its effects on the workforce. Marijuana is the same. Make sure that marijuana use and being under the influence of the substance is prohibited in your policy when it is legally allowable. You know, why should you prohibit marijuana like alcohol? You know, it, it has a number of side effects. These side effects consist of a number of different things that can be harmful for the people around, around that individual. Uh, some of those side effects are disorientation, confusion, you know, attention deficits, euphoria, dysphoria, as well as blurred vision, things like that. You know, all the side effects that we just mentioned uh, could lead to you know, major issues in you know, the work environment. So especially in safety sensitive environments. And so let's make sure we're trying to identify that. Moving on to the next slide, CBD oil, a consistently baffling discussion. So, you know, what other challenges do we have with marijuana? Obviously, marijuana is huge, but, you know, what about CBD oil? Um, first of all, CBD oil is a product that is derived from cannabis. It's a type of cannabinoid, um, which, you know, are the chemicals naturally found in marijuana plants. Even though it comes from marijuana plants, CBD doesn't create a high uh, effect uh, or any form of intoxication. Intoxication is usually, it's caused, uh, it's caused by another cannabinoid known as THC. Uh, a number of perceived health benefits uh, for, you know, CBD, I mean, there, there are a number, obviously, um, but some of these, uh, you know, benefits can include help with anxiety relief, uh, pain control, uh, it's used as a sleep aid, treatment for depression, and I think I've even heard it's used for acne in some cases, so that's interesting. Um, look, you know, looking at the title, you know, the slide. So, you know, why is CBD such a tricky issue for organizations trying to promote, you know, a drug-free workforce? You know, to start, CBD can be made from marijuana or hemp. You know, CBD made from hemp is legal because it's characterized by containing less than 0.3% of uh, THC. Uh, CBD oil made from marijuana, you know, will, can, will contain over 0.3% THC and can lead to a positive drug test. So what are some other challenges there? And so we've kind of mentioned a few things, but, you know, how about lack of oversight? You know, the CBD industry is unregulated. The FDA does not regulate or, you know, or test the uh, THC levels in some of these CBD products. Uh, since there is no regulation over the products, you know, an individual will not always know, you know, if they're taking a type of CBD oil that could lead to a positive drug test. You know, you can't always trust the label, unfortunately. Um, how about state statues? You know, like marijuana, <clears throat> the legal le legality of uh, CBD oil varies from state to state. Some states allow medicinal use and some don't. And so that's always gonna be a challenge and that, inf you know, that information coming from the states is always gonna change. You know, lastly, CBD oil has a potential impact on your organization's drug policy as well. Historically, corporate drug policies assume that a THC, detect you know, THC detected um, is from the ingestion uh, of marijuana. CBD introduces a new consideration now um, because companies will have situations to where a positive result for THC could either result from the ingestion of marijuana um, or uh, med you know, medicinal use of uh, CBD oil, potentially. You know, we're in a challenging time, uh, that's for sure. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide, CBD oil. Uh, it's just continued. Uh, to finish out the topic on CBD oil, it's probably important to know that you know, a, a number of CBD related products available in the market are, are increasing on a daily basis. Uh, not all these products have proper quality control and you know, they could be much stronger than advertised, obviously. If the products are stronger, individuals pose the risk of testing positive. You know, what happens when an individual does test positive? CBD products pose a challenge because marijuana has historically, and it's been, you know, it's, it's been the only source for THC. 
Uh, now, many CBD oils contain large amounts of THC and can lead to a positive drug test. In today's drug testing environment, laboratories have no ability to confirm if a positive test came from marijuana use or CBD oil. So that's one of the major issues you have there. Um, one last issue to cover, you know, consuming high doses of CBD oil derived from hemp and under you know, that, that is typically under 0.3% can also result in a positive drug test as well. So whether the misuse was a mistake or it was on purpose, uh, the, the use of CBD oil will drastically increase the chance of testing positive for marijuana, even though you were using it for medicinal uh, reasons, potentially. Uh, realistically, you know, CBD oil will make your job of managing a drug and alcohol program more challenging, you know, but there are other substances out there, you know, that are probably going to, you know, make life fun for you as well. We'll go ahead and move on to uh, the next slide, Delta 9 versus Delta 8. So how about Delta-9 and Delta-8? Has you know, anyone ever heard of these substances? Uh, like CBD, other hemp-derived substances are hitting the market in a variety of different products. And, you know, products like vapes, like oils and gummies, gummies are always popular. Uh, other edibles like cookies, chocolates, and drinks are also available for consumption as well. You know, like CBD oil, these products do have medicinal benefits in some cases, uh, but they also have the ability to impair an individual. And so that's always a problem. Um, Delta-8, you know, Delta-8 will give an individual more of a mild high versus Delta-9. Uh, Delta-9 is significantly more potent. Some experts believe that it's probably is about twice as powerful. Um, also, side effects are generally more severe with Delta-9 as well. Um, some of the side effects include, you know, paranoia, we hear about mental cloudiness, motor impairment, anxiety. Um, those are just a few to, to note there. You know, while Delta, you know, Delta 9 THC and Delta 8 THC may share many health benefits like CBD, each has a distinct uh, potency and a high. Understanding the differences uh, in the health effects, you know, future legality and side effects will, will be a must for organizations trying to stay on top of managing, you know, their drug and alcohol programs. As usual, the states are all over the map when it comes to regulating these substances. As of right now, I believe that we have about 21 different states that have either regulated, restricted, or banned, uh, you know, substances like Delta-8 and Delta-9. Uh, states are trying to stay on top of these new drugs, but uh, in reality, you know, they're running a little bit behind, unfortunately. So we'll go ahead and move on uh, to the next slide. It's not just marijuana, and we'll kind of focus on percentage of positive randoms by drug. And that's going to be within a five-year period as well, between 2018 and 2022. So, you know, so far we spent a lot of time on marijuana and products that are derived from THC, but it's not just marijuana. You know, looking at the chart, you know, we'll focus on Deese's year over year percentage of positive random drug tests uh, for, you know, probably the last five years. Uh, obviously, marijuana continues to be the most commonly found substance when looking at positives. Um, we're seeing a, we're, hell, we're even seeing a strong, you know, increase between 2021 and 2022 as well. But uh, how about pharmaceuticals? Um, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals that, you know, how about the, the pharmaceuticals that we spoke about earlier, even, you know, the, the legal substances, you know, on the chart, like amphetamines and opioids, you know, they continue uh, to share the same trending points. Uh, amphetamine positives are higher than opioids, and that's generally the case, but both substances seem to be decreasing in an increase, you know, and in in, in increasing in, in unison. For, it's, for instance, you know, both substances saw positive spikes during COVID, uh, during the COVID years of 2020 and 2021. Once COVID started uh, to reside, so did the percentage of positive randoms uh, for these easily attainable substances. You know why? In many ways, I believe the trend has to do with availability. You know, legal pharmaceuticals were more available during COVID, therefore positives went up for those drugs during that time frame. You know, what about illegal drugs uh, like cocaine and marijuana? Both substances showed positivity uh, decreases during the COVID years, and then uh, surprise, surprise, they increased drastically in 2022 when COVID relaxed a little bit. You know, at the end of the day, it's it's all about supply and demand, and what's readily available for the uh, illicit drug users, uh, whatever they have available to them, they're going to take to get that high. 
So moving on, we'll go ahead uh, and continue to talk about it's not just marijuana. You know, early in the webinar, you know, we spoke about the consequences of drug and alcohol abuse and how the further legalization of marijuana, you know, could, you know, make managing your, your program a lot more challenging. Unfortunately, you know, there are drugs besides marijuana that will make your job more difficult. Opioids uh, are another issue that we'll be talking about. And we've talked through positivity rates that include opioids. So everyone knows, you know, so everyone knows, you know, and what a, we can talk a little bit about what an opioid is. You know, an opioid is a illegal pharmaceutical that is used primarily for pain relief. <clears throat> you know, the substance is also used in anesthesia as well. Uh, on a national level, over 2 million people are estimated to have a problem with opioids. Painkillers are a growing problem in our nation as well. 33% of Americans use painkillers in 2017. Out of those Americans, about 12% of them didn't have a prescription, so they were getting them off the streets. So uh, like a number of drugs, you could also say that opioids, uh, you know, they're, they're becoming a gateway drug as well. Uh, it's also estimated that 80% of the heroin users in the U.S. first misused opioids before you know, they moved to heroin, and so that's uh, very alarming for sure. Um, once again, opioid use, it, it, it's going to continue to increase. It is increasing. We saw a 221% increase uh, you know, in the use you know, during COVID. Uh, it's coming down a little bit, uh, but it's still high. As a reminder, you know, drug abuse also, you know, costs citizens money, not just companies. You know, addressing the impact of substance use alone is estimated uh, potentially to cost Americans over $740 billion overall. And so uh, that's something to think about for sure. Uh, let's go ahead and move on uh, and well, let's talk about fentanyl. I know a lot of people have some interest in that conversation. So to start, you know, what is fentanyl? Uh, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is probably 50 to 100 times stronger than other opioids like morphine and heroin. Uh, pharmaceutical fentanyl has, uh, you know, initially developed for pain management treatment of cancer patients. Uh, because of its powerful properties, fentanyl is also diverted for abuse. Uh, for example, cartels use fentanyl in uh, the creation of other drugs like heroin uh, to increase, uh, increase the, pot the potency. In addition, you know, fentanyl is also being used uh, to create counterfeit pharmaceutical drugs as well. You know, in these cases, drug users have no idea, you know, that they are actually taking fentanyl. Uh, they believe that they are taking a pharmaceutical or maybe it's heroin. Uh, but, you know, with these dangers that we're looking at with fentanyl, you could say that you know, fentanyl use uh, is, is made purchasing any kind of counterfeit uh, pharmaceutical of any sort. Um, kind of like playing Russian roulette. So it, it's definitely scarier, scary. Um, the drug users don't you know, always know exactly what they're getting, unfortunately. And fentanyl is, isn't a drug uh, that is being regulated for quality assurance in any way. You know, lastly, you know, fentanyl accounts for a, a large number of opioid overdoses, deaths in the United States. In fact, nearly 70% of the 67,000 opioid overdose deaths in 2018 were due to fentanyl. On other st uh, you know, statistics you know, that are scary as well, in 2020, fentanyl overdoses were the number one cause of death for US adults between the age of 18 to 45. Very alarming, wow. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. We've got a 2019 survey impact of opioids abusing employees. This slide is a little bit of an eye chart, uh, but earlier in the presentation, you know, we spent time taking a, talking about uh, consequences of drug use. You know, like all drugs, we see that having employees on staff that abuse opioids is a problem. In uh, 2019, uh, National Safety Council survey. Uh, where they asked employers how they were impacted by opioid abuse uh, on the job. These organizations actually spoke about absenteeism, you know, decreased job performance, you know, morale issues, things that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, some of the interesting points, 17% of employees had a close call uh, or injury that was directly tied to opioid abuse. Uh, that number was up for probably about 2% from the previous year. How about, you know, 
how about less than a quarter of the employers uh, didn't directly see a corresponding challenge with opioid abuse in the workplace? I think that was probably one of the most uh, surprising things I saw there. You know, these companies are, are probably just very lucky, or maybe their supervisors need uh, reasonable suspicion training. You know, just a few thoughts there, but uh, we'll go ahead and move on uh, to the next slide. The next slide is uh, the opioid epidemic. You know, as we finish up with our conversation on opioids, and we're just about to move on, but, you know, I, I want to reiterate that, you know, there is a big challenge with opioids and other pharmaceuticals. You know, the biggest challenge uh, with opioids and other pharmaceuticals is that your employees could have a valid prescription for these drugs. Uh, the prescription can be valid, but the medication could be misused. Uh, so you're going to want to know what legal drugs uh, these individuals are taking before they're sent out into the workforce. You know, awareness is important in these situations. You know, make sure that your supervisors you know, are well-trained and know how to identify uh, employees under the influence. And also, let's also make sure that, uh, you know, your drug and alcohol program potentially is using a medical disclosure policy. And that'll lead us into the next slide. Uh, and so we're, we'll be talking about medical disclosure policies at this point. So, you know, medical disclosure policies are an effective way to ensure that you're, you're not placing an employee in a position to where they can hurt themselves or hurt someone else in the job. Uh, something to think about that people use legally prescribed drugs without failing a drug test or violating company policy all the time. And the DOT specifically states that the, you know, that the age of the prescription cannot be considered uh, in when you're reviewing positive drug tests. And so that's going to be a challenge for you. So, you know, what can you do uh, by creating a medical disclosure policy? Employees are, you know, required to notify your organization if they're taking an impairing substance. Like alcohol, pharmaceuticals are legal. We've already talked about that. But uh, just because pharmaceuticals are legal, that doesn't mean that you want someone operating a crane in a safety sensitive environment while under the influence of, you know, that impairing substance. Make sure, you know, that you have a medical disclosure form. You know, here's just a few pointers. We won't get into it too deeply uh, on, you know, uh, just, to, just to give you a few uh, pointers on, you know, on how to create one of these medical dis, uh, disclosure uh, policies. You know, first and foremost, I would say, you know, make sure that your employees are aware of what their reporting responsibilities are with this document. Employees need to know what substances are allowed, what's prohibited, or potentially what even needs to be approved before uh, they go out into the workforce. Uh, in addition, you know, make sure that medical disclosure document is, make sure that a, a medical disclosure document is signed by the employee's uh, doctor for quality control. You, know, you want to ensure that the information is correct and always up to date. Uh, you know, also, you know, require medication fitness for duty exams as well. Uh, this is specifically, you know, for safety, if you for safety concerns is for, uh, you know, through the MRO as well. Um, finally, you know, make sure that your organization is aware um, of the do's and the don'ts uh, with the, the medical disclosure policy. You know, keep medicine, you know, and medical diagnosis information out of the hands of other employees, including supervisors. Dosage, timing of medication use, medical conditions uh, being treated should only probably be disclosed or reviewed by individuals that are qualified medical personnel. Uh, finally, when administrating a policy of any sort, including uh, one of these types of policies, it's important to be consistent with all employees. Selective application of any type of company policy, including a medical disclosure, usually leads to future litigation potentially. So, all right, well, we'll go ahead and uh, lead into session three, understanding your uh, options, um, what you can test and when. So for the first slide, we'll be talking about drug testing methodologies. <clears throat> so drug testing methodologies, there are different uh, methods used, um, you know, when you're looking at drug testing. These methods differ in terms of cost, accuracy, intrusiveness, and, and where they can be administrated potentially. Um, each test looks uh, for chemical metabolites or traces uh, that the drug leaves you behind after it is eliminated from the body. Uh, the three main drug testing methods uh, that DISA and other third-party administrators specialize in are more than likely urinalysis, hair, and oral fluid. I can't uh, necessarily speak for 
uh, all the administrators out there, but uh, that's probably what it is there. Um, methodologies, you know, getting back to that, that, that piece, they defer in many ways, but all types of testing, you know, have common denominators in, you know, what they're testing for. As an organization, you want to make you have a clear view of what kind of substances uh, that you are screening. Uh, when looking at drug testing policies, you'll notice that uh, the tested substances are usually classified as panels, and you'll see that to the right. Uh, the term panel refers to drug or family of drugs included in a drug test. So, you know, for example, the, the panel of opioids includes morphine, codeine, and heroin. Uh, the more panels that a uh, test includes, the greater the scope of the test. You know, panels can also include uh, added substances known as markers into the testing. So as an example for markers, uh, you got semi-synthetic opioids such as oxycodone, oxymorphone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone. Uh, these have all been added into the opioid, opioid testing family. So um, just to kind of take a, a quick look at what we're looking at here, um, you know, we've, we talked about methodologies uh, when talking about a drug testing policy, other things to note, and we'll talk about them a little bit more later, but uh, reasons for tests. These are things that you're going to have to identify, you know, why are you testing? You've got pre-employment, uh, that's for new hires, random testing, that's uh, for ongoing testing of your employees. Uh, then you can kind of scroll down there. You're looking at post-accident reasonable suspicion. Um, to the right, though, you know, what drugs get tested for? You know, we've got two options to look at here. We've got a five-panel DOT uh, policy on the left, and then we've got a 10-panel. And so uh, what's important here is, is first and foremost, the DOT does mandate a five-panel, so you can't actually do a more stringent 10-panel uh, that would qualify, um, you know, for a, five, for a DOT test. All DOT tests you know, are going to be testing for marijuana, amphetamines, cocaine, opioids, and PCP. And then on the right, uh, this is going to be more for your, your consortium drug tests or your non-DOT uh, programs. Uh, a 10 panel is essentially, it's going to be made up just, you know, the, the base of the 10 panel is going to be just exactly, you know, for the most part, what DOT tests for, the mar marijuana, amphetamines, cocaine, and opioids. Uh, and then, but what they're doing is they're adding uh, additional testing for pharmaceuticals like barbiturates, uh, benzodiazepines, propoxyphene, methadone, and meth methacolone as well. Uh, a little bit funny to see methacolone still there. Yes, we still test for it. Uh, that's basically quaaludes. We probably haven't had a positive in 15 years for it, but it'll probably uh, continue to you know, stay there for at least for now until something else takes its place. All right, uh, next slide most common drug testing methodologies. <clears throat> so, you know, knowing the advantages and perceived disadvantages of specific drug testing methodologies is very important when you're creating your non-DOT corporate policy. Uh, factors that contribute to a company's decision on what type of methodology to, to choose uh, for their corporate policy always revolves usually around cost, accuracy, and the intrusiveness. Uh, most important, though, you know, a methodology should be chosen that best meets your organization's needs on how you're identifying illicit drug users. You know, we talked earlier uh, on the three main drug testing methodologies. So what we're looking at here on this page is we're going to be looking at detection windows uh, for the standard drug testing methodologies uh, that we previously talked about. First of all, your analysis, that detection window is anywhere from probably from a, a you know, probably, uh, I'd say, 24 hours to, you know, to seven days um, detection window. Oral fluid, you've got uh, basically, you know, your detection window is anywhere from two hours to a few days. How about blood? So, you know, blood testing isn't normally used in normal testing situations due to its intrusiveness, but, you know, it can be used in certain post-accident situations, uh, that's for sure. Blood testing provides immediate detection up to about, you know, up to about a few days at most. Um, next, you know, we'll talk about hair testing, you know, which provides a long-term detection window. Uh, the detection window for hair is actually a week to 90 days. And so uh, that's, that's totally different than what we've talked about. Uh, unfortunately, you know, a long, you know, long-term detection methodology like hair, you know, there, there's, it isn't recommended for reasonable suspicion in post-accident situations, you know, because these situations, in, in these situations, you're trying to identify if someone is under the influence. Hair doesn't help with that. It specializes in identifying habitual users by providing a long-term view of drug use. And once again, that's going to be about a week to 90 days. 
All right, well, uh, next slide, industry, industry best practices. So this is probably just probably one of the last slide to reiterate what we're what we've already kind of spoke about. You know, we learned earlier uh, that the three main methodologies are classified as short term and long term detectors. You know, as we saw, methodologies have their advantages and disadvantages in order to give your organization you know a rock solid drug policy, and short term long term barriers combined. Uh, DISA recommends that clients use a combination of short-term uh, methodology. A, a, basically, we recommend a short-term methodology like urine or oral fluid with a hair policy uh, to create a robust drug and alcohol program. You know, popular programs usually consist of, you know, short-term and long-term detection pre-employment testing for sure. So your pre-employment testing, you know, the short-term piece as well as the hair as well. And then recurring tests that are unannounced or are also adjust, suggested as well. Uh, and these, these tests can come from in the form of a random test. Lastly, you know, in the event of you know, a reasonable suspicion or post-accident testing is needed, uh, use urine, use oral fluid or blood. Hair testing, once again, it will not provide you with that early term detection, unfortunately. Okay, well, moving on, 2022 historical positive, positivity rates. So here are a few highlights for a you know, very busy slide pertaining to positivity rates here. You know, what can we take out of this? You know, first, you know, first of all, the increase of the positivity rates when you go from a five to a 10 panel, your analysis is very high. Uh, testing for more drugs almost always leads to a high positivity rate, higher positivity rate. Uh, so, you know, if you decide to go with urine or oral fluid policy for your corporate policy, you know, DISA recommends to at least do a 10 panel drug test. Uh, a 10 panel drug test will not cost any more generally than a, a normal five panel. Uh, one other thing to remember, you know, if your employees fall under DOT regulations, those employees will need to test under that DOT five panel. But, you know, these employees can also be included in a more stringent non-DOT corporate policy uh, that could test for additional drugs. And so dual testing within multiple policies is a normal practice within organizations when they're managing multiple needs, uh, you know, within their corporate policy. So just some thoughts there. Uh, one other thing, you know, one other thing of note here is, you know, how about pre-employment positivity rates for hair testing here on the very bottom, you know. First off, I mean, you know, if you're a habitual user, uh, it is harder for you to beat a hair test because the detection window is, uh, it, like I said, it's much longer. Uh, think about a, uh, a new hire. If your corporate policy only includes a short-term detection policy, the applicant can actually study up for that test. Uh, studying up simply means abstaining from drug abuse uh, for a few days so they can pass their drug test. Once they're past the test, they can actually go back to work and go back to their own old, you know, old ways. Uh, you can't do that with hair. You know, the detection window stretches to about 90 days, making it more likely that the hair test is going to identify the habitual, the habitual drug use. Uh, hence, you know, the 4% uh, pre-employment positivity rate uh, versus the consortium urine and oral fluid policies to where at most you're, what, about 1.3%. Um, one last point, you know, hair testing is a great methodology for the detection of drugs that metabolize quickly. You know, one example of a drug that metabolizes quickly that you're going to find more in a hair test is cocaine. Uh, other drugs like amphetamines and opioids are also in that same boat to where they met metabolize quickly. Um, so you're going to have a higher percentage positivity rate uh, for those types of drugs versus a urinalysis or an oral fluid. So let's go ahead and move forward. Now we're in our uh, last section of the day using all the tools and uh, starting with the first slide. So the first step, you know, what, we're, what are we gonna do and how are we gonna do it? Define your drug testing policy. Uh, the first step of building a drug policy for an organization is to identify what methodology or methodologies uh, are needed in order to meet your organization's desired result. Uh, federal regulations might require you to test a certain way in some situations, but your drug policy could consist of multiple policies with different methodologies used in different times. Uh, once again, uh, the most common methodologies in drug testing is going to be urinalysis, hair, and oral fluid. 
DISA recommends using a combination of a short-term and long-term detection methodology in order to create you know, those barriers that we speak of. So, you know, the, the short-term and long-term barrier, you've got uh, your analysis and oral fluid for that short-term detection and long-term, you know, our only option is, is hair testing and it's a great option. Uh, next, you know, next our organization will need to identify and determine what types of tests purposes uh, will be needed, uh, you know, to name a few. And we kind of mentioned them, glanced at them a little bit earlier, but you've got pre-employment testing. Pre-employment testing is when you screen applicants and future employees before they uh, come aboard. Offers almost always hinge on the results of these tests using, you know, a long-term methodology like HAIR to detect habitual users is always recommended with pre-employments along with that short term, whether it's a uh, urine or um, oral fluid. Random testing, you know, questions need to be asked about whether you will randomly test your employees. DISA does suggest that you randomly test all of your employees. Higher random percentages are always recommended uh, specifically for safety sensitive job functions. You know, why randoms? Uh, you know, uh, in my mind, a random test is probably one of the biggest deterrents that a drug program can have. You know, and we'll take a situation and we'll, we'll look at John Doe. John Doe, that John Doe, you know, he knows that he won't have to test again after he just took his pre employment test because this pilot, this program uh, doesn't have a, a, a random program added to it. So basically, in this situation, he basically knows, uh, you know, he, he, he knows that he has a green light to use drugs, uh, you know, for the entirety of his career with your organization. That's, that's not what you want. So how about reasonable suspicion? Reasonable suspicion testing, also known as for cause drug testing, is performed when supervisors have evidence or reasonable cause to suspect an employee of you know, drug abuse. Evidence is based generally upon direct observation, either by you know, a supervisor or another employee. I'd say one last reason the test is post-accident. Post-accident testing is what it, how it sounds. It's drug testing that is performed after an employee has been involved in a workplace accident. You know, this type of testing is used to determine whether drugs were a factor in the incident. And so, and generally, once again, you're not using hair for, for this type of drug test. You're, you're looking for a short-term detection. So anyway, um, to touch base on, you know, on another best practice, uh, let's make sure that your organization is sending all tests to a laboratory for analysis. At least that's our recommendation. Sending your specimens to a SAMHSA, FDA, and CAP certified laboratory will save you in the long run with any kind of potential legal litigation. Also, specimens should always be sent to a medical review officer as well. You know, a medical review officer is a licensed physician responsible for reviewing lab test results from an employer's drug testing program. Uh, the MRO must have knowledge uh, about the pharmacology and toxicology of prescriptions and even illicit drugs, as well as federal agency drug testing regulations and guidelines, and so they need to know it all. <laughs> uh, the MRO's primary duty is uh, to monitor and determine lab test results, including medical explanations for uh, confirmed positives. Uh, you know, they need to be able to talk to adulterated substituted uh, substances as well as uh, invalid drug testing results as well. Additionally, they must ensure the timeliness and accuracy of drug testing results uh, you know, throughout, the, throughout your program. And one other benefit, you know, the MRO process does uh, create a more fair opportunity for donors who are prescribed a medication that causes, you know, that could cause result in a non-negative result to provide a valid prescription or a le legitimate explanation for the results. Uh, the MRO, MRO process prevents wrongful accusations and further protects both the employer and the donors. And so it is definitely has some value there. Two last points to make, uh, you know, about your policy information pertaining to the process for fitness or duty and return to work is always a must. And also legal language that defines safety sensitive positions probably should be on your policy as well. So um, just a few thoughts there. We'll go ahead and go to step two. So step two, clearly document policy and policies. So long story short, your, your drug policy needs to be clear and concise uh, about what behaviors are prohibitive. For example, alcohol and marijuana are legal in some instances, uh, but you, you want to make sure that you prohibit the use of the substances 
at your place of work. Also, you know, make it clear in the policy that employees shouldn't be under the influence of these substances while at work. Next, you know, make sure that the parameters of the drug testing program are included in the PASAP policy. And we've kind of talked about some of these things, but, you know, how is the company testing? What methodologies does your organization prefer? You know, just my opinion, we've already talked about hair and use of a short-term uh, methodology. Uh, when does your company test? And we talked about pre-employment testing, random testing, post-accident testing, accidental testing. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, also, you know, what does your organization test for? And this can mean a lot of different things. I mean, so, and how many drugs do they test for? Is it a five panel, a 10 panel? Are we making sure that marijuana is including on all policies or just a few? Uh, you got opioids, you got cocaine, you got amphetamines. There's just a lot of decisions to be made. Uh, another question for your organization is uh, what are the consequences uh, of policy violations for your organization? Will you allow rehab and let employees come back to work once they have completed return to duty and rehab testing? Or, I mean, there's always a, another option there, or does your organization believe in zero tolerance? You know, zero tolerance in the drug testing world essentially means that the rehab isn't allowed and a positive drug test will lead to an immediate termination of the individual once it's basically verified by the MRO. Lastly, uh, let's, uh, you know, let's not forget about the, the medical disclosure form that, you know, we, we, we've already had some conversations about, you know, is it needed? In most cases, it will be. Uh, we actually provide a detail on what steps to take when creating a medical disclosure form and, and where some of the challenges will spring up as when you're doing working on that process. Um, and, you know, the next slide, we've got step three, employee education and training. And wow, uh, I think this is the last slide that we have for the day, but uh, uh, just taking a look at it, uh, you know, employee education and training, you know, once the policy has been created, it's important that your employees are educated on the specifics of the policy. In many cases, HR teams will perform policy reviews for their employees, you know, your policy updates will also need to be had when changes are, are made to your current testing policy. So ongoing requirements, uh, ongoing work is always a concern. Um, companies can also provide specific training uh, that will provide educational material. Um, that, that training can you know, be for your employees. And you know, what I would recommend for employee training is uh, employee awareness training. Employee, you know, employees need to know what substances and actions are prohibited while on the job. You know, most importantly, they also, they need to know what are the consequences of violating the policy, you know, with you know, positive tests or even a refusal to test, for example. So how about your supervisors? So supervisor awareness training, you know, is always going to be important. This is for anybody um, in my mind uh, that is managing individuals, especially individuals that are managing people that uh, um, fall under DOT requirements. That's a actual federal requirement there, but uh, giving your supervisors the knowledge uh, of how to identify illicit drug and alcohol abuse is vital. Um, you know, we want these, these individuals to follow the signs. There are three different types of signs uh, to look for. Won't go through them all, but you've got physical signs like, you know, having bloodshot eyes, maybe dilated pupils. You know, some people have slurred speech. Uh, you know, shakes or tremors, uh, potentially unexplained sweating. Uh, there's just a number of things there. How about behavioral signs? Uh, you know, attendance problems, tardiness. We've already talked about that. You know, absenteeism, also a decline in performance when you previously had a high performing employee that has uh, just gone, gone south. Uh, that's something that you, you're going to want to look at. Lastly, psychological signs, uh, unexplained changes in personality, you know, maybe it's uh, changes in the attitude, uh, maybe uh, sudden mood swings, potentially, um, all of these things can lead to or lead you to think that maybe there are some drug and alcohol uh, challenges there. Um, next, educating the supervisor on program processes and procedures, including documentation requirements are a must. Uh, for example, document all signs of symptoms and symptoms leading up and during uh, a reasonable suspicion drug test. If an employee is sent off uh, for a reasonable suspicion drug test, do not allow them to drive themselves, especially in a company car. Uh, this increases your liability because you already believe they may be under the influence. 
And, you know, lastly, you know, it's, it's always good. It's always a good idea to have your employees sign off on the policy for verification um, that they have reviewed and they understand the consequences of the program. Even when small changes are made uh, to a current policy, a, a, you know, a new signature should probably be obtained there. So, and once again, uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. Yeah. Brady, thank you so much. What a wealth yeah. of information. Mm -hmm. um, Brady, I know we're we're out of time and and frankly, we got to get to the next session. So thank you so much. If we're unable to answer your question today, we will reach back out to you in the next couple of days. Thank you so much for everyone who participated today. Bye-bye. Thank you.